name is Ann Robson. I'm Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Development at Red Oak Behavioral Health. My name is Ann Robson. I'm going to talk to you today about trauma-informed care. It's a term that many of us have heard, but frequently um, not many of us really understand what it is. What is this thing called trauma-informed care? And uh, when we talk about trauma, what are, what are we talking about specifically? I work at Red Oak Behavioral Health. Red Oak is a mental health agency that uh, primarily deals with children. We do have a small private practice that we do see adults, mostly the parents of the kids that we serve. We place therapists and case managers in our schools and uh, they deal with the children right in the schools during the school day that are referred from principals and administrators and teachers, but just these kids that are at risk that oftentimes, you know, after school hours, they, they have a lot of barriers to get to a outpatient. So we put kids right in schools. We've been doing that for about 25 years now. Um, our corporate or administrative offices are right in Highland Square, so not, not too terribly far from here. I am a licensed professional counselor. Uh, I've done this for about 38 years now, and um, once, just, once I discovered the concept of trauma and what it is and how it impacts our kids, uh, it really made sense to me, so I decided to hang around a little longer. So we're gonna talk about trauma-informed care. Is anybody familiar with that phrase? You've heard it? Yeah, trauma-informed care. So we're gonna talk about trauma-informed care. We're gonna talk about the types of trauma, um, I'm a therapist, you invited me, so we're going to talk about you and we're going to talk about me. So not uncomfortable, but we are going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how to, how to have a trauma-informed organization. What could you do here to create more of a trauma-informed organization? We're going to talk about how do you run a trauma-informed meeting? We're gonna talk about expectations and boundaries and what we expect from ourselves and what we expect from others. This is a video that Cleveland Clinic completed years ago, several years ago, pre-COVID. Um, I don't, maybe some of you have seen it, but it talks about empathy. Now I'm talking to the kings and queens of empathy here, compassion and empathy. However, it does get us in the mindset of understanding we talk about trauma-informed care. When we talk about you and we talk about me, this is an example of what we look at.
anybody have a comment or a reaction to the Cleveland Clinic empathy video? Everyone has a story. Everyone, Holly, you're right, in this room as well. We don't know what somebody in this room may have gone through to get here today. We don't know what happened last night or yesterday. But I'm guessing there are people that are even in this room that, you know, are having a hard time. A lot of things are going on in their lives. It was tough to get here. Um, but we just don't know. A trauma-informed approach assumes that most people that we interact with every single day, working, grocery store, um, have experienced some type of trauma. And we view them that way, even when they're at their best and even when they're at their worst. And we've all done it. You know, what in the world is the matter with them? Uh, I, somebody was screaming down the highway today. I live in Copley, so I took the 77. Just horn a blaring, and I'm over there going, what in the world could you be so angry at at 8.15? But maybe they had to get to the hospital. Um, you know, maybe something traumatic has happened. I don't know, but to sit in a place of judgment probably won't do anybody any good. So that is the view we take. Trauma-informed care is an approach in the human services field that assumes that an individual is more likely than not to have experienced some type of traumatic event. Um, we acknowledge the role that uh, trauma has played, including service staff, including us. I am a, a, a a therapist and um, you know back in the 80s when I first started it was you know that we had some type of position I'm sure you know in the nursing and the medical industry as well that you know everything didn't include us that's we've changed that now everything includes all of us we shift our approach from what's wrong with this person to I wonder what happened what happened to them I wonder what happened that would create such hostility, mm -hmm. such anger. I mean, every day in our political climate, we can ask ourselves, right? What in the world happened to these people that they're so angry and so insistent that they're right? What happened? I'm guessing a lot of trauma. The six principles of trauma-informed care. When you adopt a trauma-informed care, these are the six principles. Safety, trustworthiness, and transparency. Back to safety, not only physical safety, so when you come to your place, it's physically safe, morally safe, emotionally safe. You feel comfortable here. It's a safe, spiritual place for you to be. Our transparency and trustworthiness, you know, our administration is, is transparent with us. They're clear with us. Peer help, uh, peer support and mutual help, um, that we feel that, uh, we are building trust, we are enhancing safety. Peer support right now is such a popular thing, especially with youth. One thing that we do at Red Oak is mentoring. One of the more popular programs we have is the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, where the upperclassmen at the high school of wherever, say Akron Public, where am I? I'm in North Hill, so, so the North Hill kids, North High School kids come down and mentor the kids at Jennings. Such a popular and powerful thing. So it is in the workplace with adults, that peer-to-peer -peer support, collaboration and mutuality. Decisions aren't just made in Holly's office. We're a collaborative organization where people feel empowered to have voice and choice. Voice and choice also includes our consumers. It's not just the, the volunteers and the staff. It, it involves our consumers, people who we serve. And ob obviously, you know, we need to pay attention to our uh, cultural and historical perspectives. These are the principles that we live by at a trauma-informed organization. Red Oak is a trauma-informed organization. We went through a, about a year and a half long training uh, through the National Council out of Washington, D.C. to become a trauma-informed. I will tell you, though, trauma-informed is a journey, not a destination. So it's something we constantly are working at, how to be more inclusive, how to you know, be more culturally sensitive. We have a DE&I program. Um, we're all trained. We all have requirements. At first, when we introduced the program, it was another thing we have to do, right? Now it's become something I'm enjoying doing. We also participate in advocacy so that we can start to, you know, inform legislature of how 
to be more trauma-informed. Um, so we do live these principles. What are the four R's of trauma-informed care? We realize, we recognize, respond, and we resist re-traumatization. So we realize the widespread of trauma. We realize, and we'll talk about faces, adverse childhood experiences. We know in this country, at least when the CDC did the last round of stats, 67% of the people in our country have at least one ACE. If you have one, you're 87% more likely to have two. So we know that trauma is a widespread. Post-COVID, can you imagine? Can you even imagine? All of us, I would think, have some traumatic story or something. We recognize the signs and the symptoms, and I'll show you a slide on some signs and symptoms that maybe you recognize in yourself, that maybe you recognize in somebody that's close to you. We respond by integrating principles and practices uh, of trauma-informed care into our businesses, into our applications, into our interviews, and we resist re-traumatization. If we know that a, a colleague, a staff member, a volunteer has a trauma, we will not do things that trigger that trauma. I always use an example with kids. You know, when you're little, and the teacher is going to do something and she turns out the lights. Everybody's like, ooh, this is going to be fun. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be great. It's not great for everybody. Some of our children have a real big response to the dark. So if you know you have a student in your classroom who's afraid of the dark, don't turn off the lights. If you know you have a staff member who has a trauma, you know, resist those triggers. Questions? What's our, what people have as a trigger? Right, because they don't come to you and say, can I tell you about my trauma? Right. I want to tell you about my trigger so that you don't step in it. Um, if you step in it, you'll know real quick. Um, I'm guessing that your administration probably holds some of that information. And some people will never tell you. Some people will go through a trauma at work and they'll never say anything. Instead, they'll out that door into their car and just melt. You may never know. But when you do know, you try your best to pay attention to that and be sensitive to that. And even things when, when upsetting things are going to come, we'll talk about this in trauma-informed meetings, but you, know, you have to have fire drills, right? You've got to have safety things. But even given that forewarning, hey, tomorrow we're going we're to have a fire drill. I know that that's upset you. Somebody may have had a house fire. I know that's going to be upsetting to you. So let's be aware of that. So we try to prepare, but sometimes you will never know. And some people who have a lot of unresolved trauma, they hold, they hold those cards real close. And it's not something they feel comfortable with sharing because when you share, you get hurt. The different types of trauma that we see, I don't with the consumers that, that come to this wonderful place, with um, certainly the folks across the street over at Pez, uh, experience all kinds of these things. We talk about acute, chronic, and complex is what often we see in the counseling world. Acute is a single episode, something that's um, like a house fire, that is very traumatic, but it's not an ongoing situation. A chronic trauma, um, we use examples of illness and bullying and exposure to war. You certainly, the population up here in North Hill with our refugees, these folks have experienced chronic trauma if they have been in any of the camps um, over in Nepal or um, you know, the Bhutanese people. It's, it's just awful what, what they experience. Not only that, a lot of their culture prevents them from asking for help because it's not appropriate you know, in some of our Asian cultures for people to ask for help. So it's a real tough situation. Uh, but we do have therapists up at North, at Jennings, at Finley, at Forest Hill. We do have support everywhere up here. It's just a matter of, you know, building those relationships and that trust. Um, and complex trauma, probably that's one of our more severe, when people come to us with a complex trauma, generally that's where some type of severe abuse has happened in their primary setting, a sexual abuse, a, um, a physical abuse, you know, withholding food, the starvation issues. That's when that relationship that you trusted the most has been broken and damaged. And then we have to figure out how we can help those folks put that, uh, put that life back together. Um, frequently, when adults come to see us, that's where they, that's where they are. They have a series of broken relationships that things don't. They multiple jobs. They don't seem to work out. Relationships don't work out. Substance use. Generally, it's unresolved complex trauma. 
So some of the signs of unresolved, because the good news, folks, is we can resolve trauma. We can. But when we ignore it, when we don't resolve any of our issues, this is what it can look like. Um, being easily startled or frightened. These folks are always on guard. And they're defensive because their experience in life is people are dangerous. People are scary. People let me down. So you better be on guard because you never know when something's going to happen. They're always uh, on guard. They have self-destructive behaviors such as drinking, driving too fast, self-injurious behaviors. They do things that um, punish themselves because they feel they're bad. Trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating or focusing, real irritable or aggressive, um, you know, just kind of as angry outbursts that you're like, whoa, what's going on here? But um, it's, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or fold, right? It's a response to keep people in check. Overwhelming shame or guilt because, of course, unresolved trauma, everything is their fault. Everything is their fault. If it's cloudy on April 8th during the solar, it's going to be somebody's fault. Feeling detached from family or friends, because generally those folks let you down. And negative thoughts about themselves or the people around you. You know, people are bad, people are scary, people are not to be trusted. Um, just, they always, they'll go to the grocery store at times that the, the fewest amount of people are there, or they'll go to the grocery store and the most amount of people are there so they can prove their theory, saying, see how awful they are? Because sometimes people are really mean at the grocery store. I don't know about your experience, but sometimes people are really mean at the grocery store. <laughs> but it's not me, it's not personal, it's just because I'm sure either you've had a bad day or you got something going on because we're at the grocery store. I'm gonna get some candy. How could you be unhappy about that? But. Um, these folks, everything is negative. So secondary traumatic. Okay, buckle up. It's okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have anybody uh, tell me about, uh, you know, the relationship with their mother or have you lie down on a couch or anything. It's gonna be all right. Um, but we are gonna talk about some things that you or I may be experiencing with something called secondary trauma or compassion fatigue. Has anyone heard of these? Vicarious trauma. And we'll also differentiate that from burnout. Uh, but right now, the secondary uh, trauma or compassion fatigue is a real situation. It really does happen. And it can happen intermittently. Because there are days you're going to come in here and you don't feel that way. But there are other days you come in and you hear a story or you interact with someone. And it doesn't even have to be a consumer. It can be a colleague. It can be somebody on the phone seeking services. It just hits you and it's so hard. Secondary traumatic stress is the emotional duress that comes about when you hear firsthand the experiences of somebody else. You know, it's hearing what they went through. Again, sometimes you can hear what they went through and it's like, I'm good. Other times it's like, either it's too close to home or it's just maybe you're emotional that day and you're just not feeling as, as comfortable that day as you wish you would. Um, and the essential act of listening to these stories can, can diminish our professional functioning and certainly diminish the quality of our lives if we're not aware and we're not careful. That's why boundaries are so, so, so very important. And we're gonna talk about resiliency. We're gonna talk about things we do to create resiliency so that when you walk out that door, we, we, you're gonna be okay. We got, you, we got you, now it doesn't mean you're not gonna be sad or you're not gonna be concerned, but we're gonna patch you up so that you can go out there and be okay. Secondary traumatic stress. Some of the symptoms of secondary, you know, you're worried about uh, your own safety. You know, the world is scary and it's bad. Um, I'm not going to tell you there's not violence and, and, and gun violence in the world. It would be ridiculous to see, even think that because there is. But this is beyond that. This is chronically worried that things are going to go wrong. Intrusive thoughts and images related um, to your traumatic events, your fatigue and physical planes. And this isn't like, oh, I'm tired today. This is that bone fatigue that you feel it, and even in your face. You're like this, I'm tired. Feeling numbness or detachment from colleagues, you know, coming in here and going right to your office or your assignment, wherever you are, you wanna, you know, I'm not in the mood today, guys. I'm not even gonna interact with anybody. Good morning, but that's all you're getting from me. I just need to get in here, get my shift and get out. A diminished concentration, difficulty with decision-making, 
um, the desire to withdraw from other people, and feeling um, that professional inadequacy. I had a teacher one time tell me, she goes, I used to be such a good teacher, and she doesn't feel that way anymore. She just doesn't feel that way anymore. It's okay if you have some of these symptoms. It's okay if I have some of these symptoms. We could do something about it. And I would think in dealing uh, with hospice, you have some of these symptoms from time to time because you're human, and that's okay. When you stay there and it develops into something real destructive, that's, that's when we start to worry. That's when we start to worry. Questions about that? Not really a question, but comment. Um, especially working, like you said, in hospice um, and in previous workplaces. You know, when I supervised home hospice staff, we would see that compassion fatigue quite frequently because you are in high emotional situations. You build up relationships with families, with residents. And then that emotional stress builds as they pass away. Then they pass away, you get in your car, and you go to the next home. Mm -hmm. You know, there's never that moment for that closure or to honor that space that you just went through and that stress you just went through. So keeping that in mind, we try to, you know, touch base with our staff more frequently here because it's a home, right? So you, yes. it's easier to drop those boundaries. And um, I think for, you know, volunteers, too, it's, it's easy to drop boundaries and um, think of them as, as we're a friend coming into your home and visiting. And sometimes I think that makes it harder for people once they pass or move on from here to honor what it was here and, right. and find ways to deal with that. Because our residents would probably fall in that complex trauma, many, many of them. Mm -hmm. Lots of mental health, lots of addiction, lots of you know domestic violence in their past. So, really complicated people we deal with here. I bet. Yeah. Lots of horrible things that happened to them when they were little. Yeah. Just hearing Holly talk, and that's the the message and the mission of Grace House is that sensitive, caring family atmosphere among staff with the guests just coming in one morning being and hearing from the caregiver that a young man had just died several hours ago. And the look on her face as she walked in and the person had died and wasn't expected to, hadn't been here, you know, it just, mm -hmm. so when you talk about secondary trauma, there she's, what she's dealing with and me seeing that a couple hours later after that, yep. I mean, yep. it, it is a powerful, powerful motion. It sure is. Sure is. Thank you for sharing One that. After One, after One after another. One after another. So what do you do? Talk about it. Come in with my husband. Yeah. 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 Your best friend. Yeah, you got to talk yeah, about it. <laughs> Double best friend. Yeah, you got to talk about it. Even though it's really hard, and some days you probably don't even want to talk about it at all. But you got to talk about it. Yeah, you guys are heroes. So let's talk about burnout for a little bit. Um, I know a lot of you are volunteers in here, and maybe you have work outside of this, uh, or maybe you have retired and now put all your efforts into here. But burnout in work, as well as volunteerism, is real. We used to say burnout is, oh, I'm so burnt out, I'm going to take tomorrow off. You know, it was such a casual kind of, I am so burned out, I can hardly wait to go on vacation. The World Health Organization has started to recognize burnout as a very significant issue in our workforce, in our world, not just in this country. Burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been managed. Feelings of energy, depletion, or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feeling, a lot of cynicism. Why do I even do this? Why am I even here? Nobody cares. Why, what am I doing here? Am I wasting my life? What am I, what am I doing? Reduced professional efficacy in terms of um, maybe your compassion, your productivity, um, your 
compliance, because I'm sure you have compliance. I mean, things have to be done in certain ways and just resistance and just that real irritable approach to the work that doesn't seem to go away. That's what we call burnout. And it is recognized now as a very serious issue. In fact, in Europe, it's even a mental health diagnosis. So between compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress and burnout, our workforce is struggling. Now, were these things there back in the day? Yeah, they were there. They were there, we were all there. But back in the day, you didn't talk about it. You know, back when a lot of people were working, you know, the boomer generation or the greatest generation before that, you just didn't talk about it. You just dealt with it. You just dealt with it. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been, the amount of alcohol that must have been consumed? the amount of domestic violence that people got into, the amount of really negative coping mechanisms that took place. But now we're gonna talk about it. And I don't have all the answers, I really don't. But now we're gonna to start to recognize it. So if we see a staff member walking around with some symptomology that we might wanna be concerned, you know, you have ways of approaching that. So burnout, those things are happening. So we're gonna talk about ACEs for a minute, the adverse childhood experience. Anybody heard of ACEs before? I would have a little video on the uh, gentleman who did the study actually back in 1992, I think it was, out in California. So adverse childhood experiences, for those who have not heard of this, are events that happened to you when you were zero to 18, when you were little. Things that happened to you that you had no control over whatsoever, but they happened. I'm an adult now. Those unresolved issues are now affecting my life. And we'll talk about how they affect life. On your table, you have a screener. Every person, little or big, that comes to Red Oak has this trauma screen. We only do it once because we don't re-traumatize. So everyone will fill this screen out. It is recorded. Their number is recorded in our clinical record and the therapist and the case manager help families work to resolve some of these traumas. Yeah, grab one, please. Some people in this room will look at this and go, holy moly, I've got a lot of them. Other people in this room will look at it and go, I don't have any. Most people in this room most likely have two to three, most likely. But there are people who have 10, eight, seven, and they're great. It's okay, you're not your number. You're not your number. This is just simply a starting point to help people identify what are my ACEs and how are they affecting me. Some of the things you're gonna see on there, um, you know, there's, there's, there's abuse situations, there's substance use situations, there's broken family situations. Nowadays in the world we live in, we even include, or some organizations include, environmental factors, racism, the social determinants of health, of, of poverty and food insecurity. There's all kinds of things that are happening in our world that um, little people are going through and they grow up and now what? This is a video about the, uh, the folks who did the study kind of go over their findings. The way it started that I, and if anybody has more information, please feel free to jump in, go correct me. Um, back in the 90s, Dr. Filetti was the founder of the study. He worked at a clinic that um, people that struggle with weight loss came in to see him, predominantly women came in to see him about maybe some bariatric surgeries or some, some things that they could do to lose weight because they were very unsuccessful about doing this. So he got this clinic going and did his stuff and people started losing weight. People started losing weight. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm a genius. All these people are losing weight. Well, lo and behold, after a course of losing weight, a course of time, guess what they happened? Gained it all back or more. And he's like, what happened? What is the phenomena with this? Well, through trial of, of several of them, he, he would ask, you know, how did this happen? That you lost all this weight and here you come back and you see me and you've gained it all back. Well, one of the women that he talked to said, um, well, I was at work and a coworker um, sexually harassed me. Okay, come to find out she was a sexual abuse survivor when she was little, triggered 
all of her trauma that is completely unresolved, things she thought she put away, she did not, and gained all this weight back. And he's like, oh my gosh, really that? And he started asking other people, and lo and behold, here it goes. He found out all these women had some type of abuse history that when it was triggered, all the weight came back on. Because food, for some people, makes it better. It just, it just does. Now, we've all probably joked about it and said, I'm going to go home and eat ice cream. I'm going to feel better. These folks take it to the highest level. So it is a video explaining some of the things, some of the other physical manifestations that we see. A lot of problems. Rob and Vince then began a collaboration that's ultimately become one of the foremost epidemiologic studies of long-term health impacts of uh, child abuse and neglect. I think the most important thing that contributes to the information of the ACE study is simply uh, the powerful nature of when people tell you the truth about their lives and you listen, you understand their life course. It's made me realize how much of what we see in adult medicine is the result of what was present but not seen in pediatrics. Ace has changed the landscape, and I want to talk a little bit about how and why they changed the landscape and, and how we can take what we've learned from the ACEs. It's just not a social worker's problem. It's just not a, a psychologist's problem. It's not a pediatrician's problem. It's not a juvenile court judges problem. It's everybody's. It changed the landscape because of the pervasiveness of the ACEs, the huge number of public health problems, expensive public health problems, depression, substance abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, cancer, heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes. As the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of chronic self-acknowledged chronic depression goes up so that at ACE score four or higher, you're bumping a prevalence of 60%, 6-0% in women and about 35% in men. This is the percentage of people that ever smoke cigarettes, and here's the percentage of current smokers. I mean, we could switch the titles on these slides now. You wouldn't know which was from the Kaiser Health Plan and which was a general population sample in Washington. So how do those people, without the conventional risk factors, end up with coronary disease? We have used this over an eight-year period with 440,000 adult patients. I believe that this is the most important thing you can ever do, which is begin to deal with this this intergenerational transmission of adversity that causes so many problems in our society. Any response to the video? Those were the uh, creators of the study. And they continue to recreate the study um, with, um, and most of them are white middle class women, so they continue to recreate this study with people of all types of ethnicities and cultures so that we can get accurate information on, on many races and genders. Men are not excluded. So let's talk about ACEs by the numbers. At least 61% of adults survey have at least one ACE. If you have one, you're 87% more likely to have two. One in six adults have at least four ACEs. When we in the mental health world start to see three and above, that's when we start to get concerned. Anything above three and above can result in medical complications, very serious medical complications, if not dealt with. Now, there are people that have ACE scores of eight. They're doing great. So it's a matter of dealing with it. But um, at Red Oak, most of our little ones that we see have an A score of averaging three. Our teenagers have an average of about four right now. 
For adults who have six or more ACEs, their life could be, capacity could be diminished by 20 years. So the reason that is, is because oftentimes that's where you see the diabetes, the heart disease, the cancer, the asthma, substance use, high risk behaviors in that six or more category for unresolved ACEs. We spend about $748 billion in North America um, on unresolved ACEs due to the multiple uh, health conditions. And of course, so many of these folks live in situations where they don't have a primary care physician. They use the emergency room as their primary. 97% of the inmates that we serve, and of course that's one of the most expensive things we do in this country is house inmates, but I'm betting probably most of you are too, that that's a lot, it was probably 100%. And of course we all know that if you have one, you have two, and most likely those guys and gals have more than that. Two thirds of the children have experienced at least one ACE. That is what is in front of you. What are some positive things that have happened to people in their life that they've either overcome their ACEs or they never, they, they didn't have ACEs as a child? So what are the protective factors for little people? So if you have little ones in your life, like I have Frank, she's our granddaughter. We call her Frank, I know. With Frankie, what do mom and dad need to do to make sure that they protect her? Well, these are some of the things we found out through research. We feel we're able to talk to our family about our feelings. Uh, feel like your family stood by you during difficult times. Enjoy participating in community traditions. St. Patrick's Day, got a big parade coming up, multiple parades all around. Some people are just like, that is our jam. We're going to go. We do it every year. I love it. Grandma and Grandpa come. Aunt and Uncle come. This is our thing. A sense of belonging in high school. Big issue in our, in our world today. Um, there are kids that you know, we know right now up at North High School that they don't fit in, they get bullied, or they, they bully. Um, they, they're just finding a real hard time finding their niche. You know, where, where do I belong? And then there are other kids that are, you know, thriving. They have, they belong, they volunteer, they're in the office, uh, doing great things, they're on sports teams, arts, literature, they're doing all kinds of stuff. High school is pivotal. They feel supported by friends. They have a real nice group of friends who are positive and supporting. And they have at least two non-parent adults in their life. Oftentimes it's that favorite teacher. You know, you guys right now, I'm sure, can think of your, the teacher that you just loved when you were little. He or she was just wonderful. Was there anybody else? One thing I love about mentoring that adult that comes into the building to mentor can be that second. There's all kinds of adults. Of course, there's all kinds of adults that can be destructive too, but generally there's two people. Maybe there were two teachers, maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was somebody at church, a troop leader, but generally these kids who have these nice protective factors, two non-parents, and they feel uh, safe and protected in your home. You know, dad's not gonna let anything happen. I'm good, I can go to sleep because dad's not gonna let anything happen. Mom's got the door locked, we're good. Nothing's gonna happen. We don't let people in here that are gonna hurt me. So these are our paces and they're doing a lot of research on what creates a healthy child, what creates a healthy adult. These are some of the categories. Questions about that? Because it's not all doom and gloom, guys. I promise you, I promise you. We're just trying to talk about it so we can resolve it so that we can live a little healthier. So the more of these positive experiences you have, the more they can offset any traumatic experience. It sure can. It sure can. Yep. Yeah. Even now, so if we have a little one who has a high A score, if we can introduce some of these concepts, yeah, we can really build that resilience and that child most likely will go up and be a healthy, functional adult. Even as adults, we're going to talk about resiliency. We're going to talk about what you and I can do to build our resiliency. So if we have some ACEs or we have some experiences, we're going to figure out what we can do about it. Not overnight, over time. So what is resilience? What is resilience? The antidote to ACEs is building resilience. Negative things happen in life. That's just the way it goes. Whether they're out of our control or in our control, bad things happen to good people. So what do we do to deal with that? We build our resilience. It's the ability to bounce back from difficult times. You're not born with resilience. 
Well, she's, you know, she, she was born with all the resiliency skills. Look at her. No, 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 no. This is something that you build, something that you're aware of and you create within yourself, uh, within your environment. And we're going to talk about what some of those things are. Psychologists define it as the process of adapting in the face of adversity. You know, what Timex takes a licking and keeps on ticking, right? That's adversity or that's resilience. Um, they're able to bounce back and have growth even during the most difficult times. Um, but again, this is over a period of time. So resiliency is the antidote to ACEs. So characteristics of a resilient person, and I want you to think about what do I have? What do I have any of these? They have healthy and strong connection to social resources such as family, culture, and community and peers. Real strong connection to things that ground them. Positive future orientation, commitment to work and learning. I'm committed to learning. I'm committed, like all of you here today, um, you're committed to learning something different. Hopefully you'll walk away going, I didn't know that. I learned that. That's great. Yeah, I could do that. Or, wow, I didn't know that. They have empathy, as we learned at the Cleveland Clinic. Great deal of empathy for other people, no matter how the presentation is. They create this, they, they believe in empathy. Um, they have uh, empowerment and self-control. People that are resilient are uh, practice self-regulation. Now, I know you guys have seen folks that are dysregulated all the time. You've seen little people and older people that completely come unglued. They flip their lid and they're off. Big emotions, big behaviors. Practicing resiliency allows you to regulate, you know, your mind, your feelings, your body. Things are in control. These folks are calm, composed, have a great sense of humor, uh, the effective emotional regulation, and they have a spiritual perspective, right? They believe in something. You can believe, as AA taught us, you know, if you believe in a higher power, chances are that you're going to get healthier, right? I always say, if you believe in this water bottle, it's better than believing in nothing. But folks who believe in something have better mental health. Something. I'm not going to tell you what that is, whether it's a, a faith-based or uh, environmentally based. Believe in something, something bigger than yourself. These folks have a great internal locus of control as opposed to an external locus of control. When people often enter therapy, they come in and, you know, they basically ask, we ask what, what needs to change for you to feel better, and oftentimes it's everybody else. You know what needs to change? Everybody else. If they would just get better, then it wouldn't affect me so much. I'd be all right. Oh, guess what? We gotta move all that inward because <laughs> the world isn't gonna change so you can feel better. Um, I wish that were the case, but it isn't. But putting that power back on you to make the changes. Resilient folks know that I have to change in order to make me feel better. Um, they have confidence and optimism. They stay well and they have a healthy lifestyle to stay well, whether that's eating, exercising, sleeping, who they're with, literature, arts, recreation, hobbies, whatever it is, they commit to staying well. Easier said than done, right? Woo. Okay, now we're gonna look at the next slide and we're gonna talk about some of the things that we can do. Audience participation, big deep breath, all right? Take a drink of water if you got it. You're all right, you're all right. So who makes time for their closest relationship and connects regularly with other people? Who does that in this room? Yeah, it's hard to do, it's hard to do. We're expecting twins, right? I'm thinking about the people because Natalie, that's our daughter, she said, you know, it's okay, we're, we're 10 weeks and it's okay, you can tell people. And I'm thinking, if I have to tell people, that means I have to connect with them and that means I'm going to have to do either a lot of talking or a lot of texting. Can't I just do a group text and just get this all over at once? I mean, I, isn't that ridiculous? I'm j overjoyed. But at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> now I've got to talk to all these people. That is hard to do. So if you are doing it and you're connecting with regularly with people, God bless you. You're doing a great job. That's a healthy coping skill. Prioritizing exercise. Uh-oh. 30 minutes of exercise that makes you breathe harder most days of the week. Who's doing it? A lot of people in here. Good for you. Who wants me to never say the word exercise again? Yeah, a lot of people are like, don't just stop it. We all know it. We all know it. 
my husband and I go to Orange Theory. We're in Copley and we go to Orange Theory. It's a gym up there. Anybody Orange Theory? You Orange Theory? A couple times. You know, well, we have to modify. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to be jumping all around on that and doing all that. Um, <laughs> but I can do some of the things. Um, but uh, it really, it, it's a sense of community and it's scripted. So it's, it's a lot easier. But with our weather coming, beautiful days more often than not, you know, get out there and exercise. Being in nature is such a healthy thing to do. Follow a healthy diet and maintain good sleep practices. Who got eight hours last night? Oh, I didn't see as many hands on this one. Who got more than eight hours? Who got less? Yeah, what? It's okay. Don't keep doing it, though, because then you'll end up face down, and then we'll all be like, what happened? Um, so getting that, that rest, figuring out a way to rest peacefully, and even if you're not sleeping, a way to turn your mind off so that you're able to just be calm and still. Follow a healthy diet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> just move on. <laughs> I'm not eating chicken and green beans one more time. Um, ask for help and accept it. I'm not asking. Anybody do? Okay, you do. You if if you, if you ask for it, then you accept it. Good for you, because that's a hard one to do. My kids offer, so I just accept it. Good for you, because most of us just want to complain. I don't. I don't want you to help me. I'm asking you to solve my problem. Tell my husband. I'm not asking you to solve my problem. He's. Well, why are you bringing it up? Because I want to complain. <laughs> What do you think I'm bringing it up for? Plan something to look forward to? Who has something they're looking forward to? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Something to look forward to. Guys, I'm not talking about a trip to Tahiti. I'm not. I'm talking about dinner tonight. You know, I'm talking about lunch. Who's got a great lunch and they can hardly wait to eat it? That is what I'm talking about. Simple. Not oh, I have to have this world cruise and something. That's just not the way it goes. This is not, it's a beautiful, I'm going to hope, I'm going to try to grill chicken tonight. I am pumped about that. <laughs> yeah, a little glass of wine, some chicken. Regularly engage in activities that you find relaxing. Who, who has something that they do that is relaxing? Yeah. Anybody feel comfortable sharing? What do you do? Cycling. Cycling? That, you, can, you check a lot of those boxes with that activity. Good for you. Anybody else feel comfortable? Yeah. Ooh, what kind of artwork do you do? We have an artist in residence. <laughs> Could never do it until I retired, so I'm not great at it, but I enjoy it. I think that's just wonderful to even try to do something like that. And reading, I've taken up reading again. I enjoy that. What do you like to read? Who's? Pearl's book. I started out rereading her stuff. Good for you. Such a healthy thing for your mind. Yeah, what do you do? I love to read. What do you read? Um, just all kinds of fiction. I have some favorite authors. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I do too. I said to Holly, do you need some donations? Because during COVID, the library was closed, so I have all these books. Because I wow. needed that in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so good. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else want to share something they're doing? Walking with friends. Walking with friends. Now, do you have a group of uh, friends that you guys pretty rely on each other and go out? Yeah, a couple of us, yes. You go out in your neighborhood, or do you take a trail? Uh, we have a couple, of, well, in my neighborhood and hers. Yeah. You know, it's just wonderful. I always see groups of and predominantly women that are out walking and gabbing and just, again, checking off, yeah. checking got, off the boxes. That's right. Now, did you walk like six feet apart when you had COVID? Uh, when we were, or did you guys break the rule? We were outside. We were outside, so we could be a little closer. I did. I saw groups of like two or three people walking, and they're like this far apart, shouting. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, COVID. Okay. Things you find enjoyable. Keep it up. Be kind to yourself and show grace to others. We learned that in COVID, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Be kind and show grace to others. People are trying to do the best they can. We had a big thing at Red Oak about assuming positive intent. 
People are trying to do the best they can. Learn from others who might be good role models for self-care. Does anybody have somebody who you really admire and he or she is really um, doing a nice job and they're, they're aging with grace and they're good role models? People you admire. It doesn't matter if you know them or not. You just admire them. You see them. Yeah, you have somebody you admire? Yeah, my, my husband. Um, <laughs> he um, has worked out uh, regularly since he was in his 20s. Oh, my. He's in his 60s now. And he's very fit. He's very healthy. But he's very, um, like, relaxed yeah. about it. It's yeah. not like a big thing right. to him. He just does it. Oh, sweet I'm, man. I'm impressed by that because not that many people can sustain that for that long. So. Part of his life. Yeah. It's a life habit. Good for him. Yeah. And good for him bringing him up. Yeah. yeah. And finally, the best way, and you guys more than anybody know, the best way to build your resilience is to give to others. And that's a research-based suggestion. The best way to feel better about yourself is to give to others, 100%. Anything that you guys want to add? Things that you're doing that you feel, that's building my resilience, it's a healthy habit, I want to share it. I think um, a lot of those things on the list are counterintuitive when you are feeling weighed down. Yes. Um, and certainly the last one, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Giving to other people, it, it just builds yep. something strong. But it is the hardest thing to do. Very much. It's like, it's like, like the exercise we were just talking about. Taking that first step mm -hmm. is the challenge. Oh. Once you're in it, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, it takes on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. But those are all things that take an intentionality. Yes, ma'am. Because they're not the natural response right. Right. when you're stressed. Yeah, you'll feel good. And overwhelmed. Right, yeah. exactly. You're, you're exactly right. Very, very hard to do. Um, that's why it's so beautiful when you have a, a somebody who's looking out for you or somebody who says, hey, come, come on, let's go. We're going to go for a walk. We're going to go outside. Even just here, when you walk out that door, it's going to remind you there's a whole world out there waiting for you. It's one of the healthiest things you could do is just go outside for a minute. But it is very, when you don't feel good, it's, it's, these are very difficult things to do. Well, and, and especially the caring and giving to others. Yeah. When you feel depleted yourself. Right. Because in order to give to others, you have to know others. You do. And mm -hmm. if you know others, the only way that you can give is to connect. So a lot of them are all like yep. tied into each other. Yep. It's more of yep. You're right. a self-care style of living than just isolated right. tools. Right. Can't pour from an empty cup. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's so important, especially as caregivers, that you do that self-assessment. How am I doing? How am I doing? Do I really need to go in today or do I need to be at home? No, I need to go. I need to go. Do I, you know, do I need to step back or do I need to go? You, you really have to do that inventory almost daily. Yeah. I think developing a sense of gratitude. Oh, it's, gratitude is a wonderful word. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And nurturing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so much to be grateful for people, things. But uh, many people keep the gratitude journals, you know, just every day they document what they're grateful for. And that's a wonderful suggestion, wonderful word. So how are we going to build resilience within Grace House? You know, individually we talked about things that we can do, but what about organizationally? How do you build resilience? And maybe how you're already doing this. You feel like your, your organization is practicing a lot of these things. Um, so these could just be gentle reminders. Um, expectations, how to set realistic ones for yourself or others. And we're going to talk about questions that we can ask ourselves and others about what kind of expectations are we setting? Boundary setting, that's a big word. Boundaries, Set it, know what to say yes to, know what to say no to. And, and ladies, I'm gonna pick on you for a minute. Um, we're real bad at that. And 
it's a lifelong thing that you, you every once in a while you're saying, I'm doing a lot better at that. I'm setting more boundaries than I ever have. And we're proud of it because it's just not something that comes naturally. Can you explain a little bit more about boundary setting? Say it again now. Can you just explain a little bit more about boundary setting? Like, you know, exactly what you're talking about. Where do you, where, how, do you, how do you decide where to set those boundaries? Right. How do you decide where to set those yeah. boundaries? What do you say yes to? What do you say no to? Yeah, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the zone of helpfulness because so many people are over involved in things. She's in everything. She's just everywhere and she's in everything. And then you have that zone of total detachment. She won't do anything. I never see her out anymore. Why won't she help us? And then you have that middle. It's like passive and aggressive and assertive in the middle. So we're going to talk about it. The staff culture, how do we connect with each other in meaningful ways? And of course, you know, self-care, your, your mind, spirit, and, and body, you, you're making all those connections. But we're going to start with expectations, and expectations ties into boundaries as well. So understanding your expectations, and this is, again, a, this is an active sport here. What positive uh, role do expectations play in your life? What impact have unrealistic self-expectations played in your life? What has the impact of others' unrealistic expectations played? And how do you assess if expectations are at a hopeful or aspirational level? So expectations, um, do they play a positive role in our lives? What impact have unrealistic self-expectations had on your well-being? Unrealistic self-imposed expectations. Suffocating. <laughs> what did it's you? Suffocating. They're suffocating. Yeah. Yeah. Heavy yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, whether they're old tapes that uh, somebody in your life uh, told you you had to be or things that you feel... I have to do, and yeah, it is suffocating. Oh, because you can never meet them. I know. You no, can never meet them. Yeah, quite never good enough. Right. Never good enough. Yeah. Being aware of that is a very important issue. And what about other people's self expectations? You know, other people that have been in your life that had total unrealized expectations of what you could do or even wanted to do. You know, are those tapes playing in your head? No matter how tough it gets, I'm just gonna, I wanna be there. Or I'm gonna exercise three days a week, no matter how much I don't wanna go, I'm gonna put those feet on the floor and I'm gonna go. But set realistic expectations that keep you in the game. Expectations of yourself and others. So I'm a very strength-based person. I know my weaknesses. <laughs> I'm very, very familiar with them. Um, but what are my strengths? I'm asking you, what are your strengths? What, what do you do really well? And tapping into that during those very difficult times. Um, what has helped you endure during difficult times? As you, as you look back, I mean, you all are adults. You've had times that have been challenging. What helped you? Whether it was people, an inner strength of yours, a combination, um, whatever has helped you, I want you to remember those things. I can endure difficult, challenging times. What healthy things can you do to soothe yourself? Does anybody have a mantra that they say to themselves during difficult times? Anybody willing to share it? Yeah. It's a, it's a phrase from, um, she's not a saint, but she's a mystic in, in the Catholic faith, and it's uh, Julian of Norwich, and it's all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Just in a little prayer like that. And you can say that, and you feel like, that helps me. Yeah, yeah. That helps yeah. me. Just put one foot in front of the other. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. I love that you're able to access that in times of need because it does help, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does, especially when you lift it up. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have something they tell themselves? Yeah. I, have, I keep a journal, wonderful. and I, I have these sayings that I like, and you know, like, uh, it's not what you say, it's what you do that shows you who, who you are. Or some jokes that I always find funny every time I read them, and um, I love those things. And uh -huh. so, you know, I read that. That's time. wonderful. Yeah, I teach my grandson some of those things too. <laughs> How old is he, Grandma? 
12. He's 12. Yeah. Oh, you're in the thick of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we're pretty close. Wonderful. Oh, you know, so glad he has you. He's to be a good kid. Absolutely. because he's really close to his grandma. That's right. <laughs> what a huge protective factor that is to have a healthy relationship with um, your grandparents. It's wonderful. Mantras. I went to Columbus on Tuesday and it was pitch black. And, uh, I, you know, I'm 61 years old. I've been doing this a long time. For some reason, I got so nervous on 71 going south. It was so dark. The trucks were going so fast. I could just, I'm thinking, there's deer going to jump out. The trucks are going to run into me. I'm never going to make it to the conference. You know, I'm just like going, to, I'm spiraling. And so I just had to get myself, pull over in the right lane, slow your speed down. You're okay. You're okay. Keep swimming. You have that cute little Disney show where Dory had to just keep swimming. You're all right. You're all right. Get that heart rate down. And it works. Whatever your mantra is. What are resources to increase my resilience? Resources could be people. They could be literature. They could be movies. Journaling. I've had two people today say journaling, gratitude, journaling. Absolutely. What are your resources to increase your resiliency? And as always, what is strong with me rather than what is wrong with me? You know, how many times I know I, what is wrong with you? What is strong with me? What can I do to tap in to get through difficult times? Do I need to pick up the phone? Do I need to journal? Do I need to go outside? What do you need to do? Do I need to bury in books? Because I'm a bookie too. What do you need to do? What is strong with you? So here's your boundaries. This is just a little graphic that was put together of how to be in that zone of helpfulness. So right in the middle, it says the zone of helpfulness. So in your middle is your, is your zone of helpfulness. Over to the right is under-involved. These are the folks that don't volunteer for anything. They don't get involved in anything. At staff meetings, when the boss says, you know, I need help with this, head down. Nope, not me. Over on the left is the over-involved group. Me, 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 me. I'll get involved again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Well, didn't you, how are you working on those other two projects? Well, they're not getting done, but I'll do that one too. You know, they're just over-involved with everybody. So how to create that boundary language? And I'll read these two. How do you create that boundary language? So setting boundary with a colleague, I'm working on showing up with good energy for our team. I find that when we talk too much about what I can't control, it makes it hard for me. So let's switch topics. You, around those negative people, that, that they, all they want to do is talk and gossip. Just crab and fuss about what isn't going right. Being able to set that boundary and say, when we talk about things like this, I'm not able to show up in a healthy way for my team. Responding to an angry colleague. I want to work and figure this out, but it's uh, too hard if our brains aren't calm enough to think. How about we take a five minute break? Now, some people can take a five minute break, come back to the table, go, you know, I was out of line, I apologize. <laughs> I'm just having a real tough time. Sorry about that. Other people, five minutes, they're even more wound up than when they left the table. Uh, so you, I don't know what you run into. But it's OK to call a timeout and say, you know what? I don't think this is going to be productive when our voices get escalated like this. Some people will hear you, and they'll go, you're right. So other people will say, you got to tell me what to do. I don't know what you're going to run into. You can't control other people, but you can control yourself. And then finally, saying no to extra commitments. Although our team goals are really important to me, I need to discuss what can come off my plate or what I can do in a different manner in order to take something else on. I'm working on how to balance my family's needs and my own workload. So the balance. Healthy people with healthy boundaries often are balanced. They have compassion for others and self-compassion. They are balanced. They know what to say yes to. They know what they need to say no to. Saying no is not a bad word. In fact, it's a complete sentence. No. Now, you're not going, hell no, or, you know, get out of my face, no. It's no is a complete sentence. So boundaries are hard. They are hard because you feel like you're being mean, uncooperative, 
but the, you're not. Creating safe spaces. Uh, at, at Red Oak, we are currently undergoing a renovation at our building. We're at 611 West Market Street, which is up in um, Highland Square, kind of right by the uh, original Rockney's Pub, right there at Rhodes and, and Market. Um, it's, a, it's a big building. Um, you'll see the sign. There's a big butterfly out front, and you'll see a sign that says we're growing again. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to recreate spaces in that building that's been there. Oh, I'm sure that building's been there. 75, 80 years, maybe more than that. Um, so we're trying to create spaces that are safe for people. We know in trauma-informed approach that the way somebody enters a building can make or break how they feel and whether they're gonna follow through, in this case with therapy, how they walk in. So what doesn't help are congested areas. You know, that I have to walk through lots of different kinds of things to get where I'm going. Uh, poor signage that is confusing. Where do I check in? Where do I sign in? Who do I talk to? There's no signs. People are busy and people are just like wandering around. They're already nervous because they're coming in for therapy. So they're already nervous. Kids are misbehaving because they're probably nervous too. Uncomfortable furniture. Uh, we used to believe that all furniture had to be wipeable. You know, we didn't want anybody because we had a mass of bed bugs, we had lice, we had hygiene issues, we had all kinds of things. So we created the most uncomfortable furniture possible for these folks to sit in so that we wouldn't be affected by their poor hygiene. Separate bathrooms. Staff, bathroom, everybody else. Now, I'm not saying you can't separate men and women. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that debate. Cold and uninviting colors things that are faded and ugly. So what does help? Comfortable, calming, private waiting areas too. You always have a big waiting area, but maybe somebody who's got a very serious anxiety disorder, they may need a little area back there. Maybe my kids need a little bit more privacy. So being very aware of that, I love that. Furniture that is clean and comfortable and no wrong door. When we first got into the building, we had four entrances into the building. These four people would come to our building and go, where do I go in? I got four. And then, of course, inevitably, they'd pick the wrong door. How can I help you? Where, where were you supposed to be? And so, I don't know. I was told to come to 611 West Market. Oh, you have to go back out and go around and go in that door. Really? Integrated restrooms. already preached about that. <laughs> Message... Uh, Messages that are, are positive and hopeful. Glad you're here. Welcome. How can I help? It is so important when people are coming for care that they don't have to keep guessing about where they're supposed to go, who they're supposed to see, what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to say. We want to make it as clear as possible. Take some of that burden off of them and put it on us. Name tags. One of the simplest things you can do. We're going to talk about meetings. Boss looks at this poor soul and says, are you certain you tried hard enough to get to the meeting on time? Look at this man. <laughs> Who's, who, has anybody been him? I mean, you literally come into a meeting and you're disheveled and you're a mess and you don't know what's going on and maybe you're a little teary and you're like, I know, I just got here. I, I know I have, I have. It's really hard to come into a meeting feeling that way. So what do we do? Holly, do you guys have meetings here, staff meetings? You meet in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are just some suggestions, and, and it can be with anything. It doesn't have to be like official meeting, meeting. I know at Red Oak, we have meet, lots of meetings for lots of things. One thing that all therapists and case managers have to have is supervision. So I have a people that I supervise. So when they come into the meeting, we have a check-in. Before we even get started with, now I need this, 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 and this, and this, we have a check-in. Give these folks a chance to arrive. And we have an icebreaker, you know. Tell me something, uh, what was it last week for our big meeting, uh, that you have done that you never thought you'd do. You know, tell me something you've done that you never thought you would do. So we have a chance to arrive at our meetings. So using the six principles of trauma-informed care, some suggestions. So safety. Have we made a plan for staff to check in? 
You know, do we check in? Because everybody's going to come in here, hurried or not, but we need to let them sit down. Have we openly discussed how to handle conflict and different opinions? You know, we're going to have different opinions about different things. How do we want to handle that? What do you guys want to do about that? And then if stress levels are raised, do we have ways to release energy? I put on your tables the pipe cleaners. And God bless you all. You're so grown up because nobody <laughs> messed with them. <laughs> guys are such adults. I can't even believe it. Yeah, you can mess with them. It was real cute. I went to a... I went to a, 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 and they're counselors, they're, what a group, um, to a school, and we had their whole psychology and counseling staff along with their principals kind of just talking about some things, and I put these out because we wanted to talk about how do you run a trauma-informed meeting with parents, and I put them out on the table. Those folks had, they weaved them in and out and upside down and all around. We had shamrocks and hearts and just mangled messes. Um, they didn't even know what I planned to do with them, but they immediately started uh, fidgeting. And you guys, not one of you, I kept thinking, well, they're going to pick those things up and start manipulating them. <laughs> Holly, you're so regulated here. <laughs> My work is done. If you're not messing with the fancy, pretty pipe cleaners, then I, I don't know, because those are pretty. But that's why they're there. Fidgets. You know, if you're going to have a tough topic, put something on the table that people can, uh, people can fidget with. One of the best things you could do is Play-Doh. You know, get those little tiny things of Play-Doh. Now, I know as adults and as parents, you're like, Play-Doh, Lord have mercy, how much Play-Doh did I clean up out of the house? But it really is very helpful. Markers, um, Post-its that people can mess with. Anything manipulatives. It really does help people that are uncomfortable with conflict or whatever you're talking about, gives them a place to go. They'll listen, but they need something to do, do with their hands. If uh, the room was full of young people, and I, I'm not picking on you guys, I promise I'm not, um, you know, the phones and the computers would be out, you know, and we don't want that. We want them to put those things away for a minute. So getting the paper on the table in a way to give them something to do, because in a conference, people have their computers out. I guarantee you they're not conferencing. They're shopping, emailing, whether it's because that's what they want to do or because of, of their own anxiety that they're nervous about the topics and they want to fidget. So give them something to fidget. You create safety. So trustworthiness and transparency. Um, a description of expectation reminders about self-care. You know, giving folks that reminder of you need to use the restroom, please do. If this topic upsets you and you need to leave the room, please do. No judgment zone, right? Setting that stage. Create authentic uh, connections uh, and laughter. It doesn't have to be all so serious. Trauma is a very serious topic. I get that. But we can make room for, for the relationship and connections. Acknowledge emotional responses. This is a tough issue. You know, if Holly's going to bring something to the table, and I'm picking on you, if Holly brings something to the table that it is going to be a tough issue, she might want to kind of preset that. It's going to be kind of a tough issue to talk about, but I know we need to talk about it. How do we want to handle this? You know, setting that stage so people have predictability and they can trust that she's going to keep them safe. You know, I'm going to be okay when I'm here. I'm going to be okay no matter how sad or difficult there's going to be laughter and fellowship, and they're safe, and they know that. I always hope that everybody can feel that way, even if you work at the University of Akron or, or Ohio Edison or wherever you are, that you feel safe to be yourself. Um, but I don't know that it's that way. I just don't know that our environment and our society has created enough safety for people. So within this trustworthiness and transparency, on a personal level, like how, how do you be a safe person? I think that be the most consistent person you can be. Do what you say you're going to do. If I tell you this morning I was going to show up and we were going to talk about trauma-informed care, that I come, I, I keep my commitments, I'm as consistent as possible, I'm accessible, mm -hmm. I'm, um, my phone rings, you know I'm going to answer it within reason, all within reason. Um, you know, just things that create a, a friendly atmosphere and, and be nice and kind. Be authentic. 
Be authentic. authentic. You know, yeah, show sure. up. Do you think that consistency for this population is really important? Huge. Dealing with people who systems have failed them over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So um, having that consistency here is pretty important to build up trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. If you say I'm going to see you tomorrow, see him tomorrow. Right. Yeah, same way with children. If I couldn't get to you today, but I'll see you tomorrow, you better show up. Peer support and uh, mutual self-help. Uh, for variables that can't be controlled, brief staff on what may come up. Again, we talked about the fire drills, you know, tornado drills. Um, of course, nowadays, shooter drills, intruder alerts. We have to give staff some control over uh, when these things happen so they don't feel so alarmed. I get asked to go to schools all the time to help staff debrief after these shooter drills, these active shooter drills where they have the police department. They come in and they, they create situations. I can't even tell you the trauma that some of the staff members go through um, during these times. So we have a safe room that if you can't be in that activity, you come in here. And I'm there waiting to see, you know, to, to try to assist. Because there's no shame in saying, I, this is just too anxiety producing for me. I can't do it. It's too traumatizing. Um, but they're doing them. And, you know, they're not going to not do them. Um, I, I found a, a, it wasn't me who said it, but somebody said, you know, we don't set the place on fire when we do a fire drill. We don't have a tornado. We don't create a tornado. when we. So why do we have to bring the active shooters into the building and, and do this? Um, but right now that's the model. And... Um, it could be very, very, very traumatizing for some people. And for other people, they're like, bring it on. I want to know where to go and what to do. We are uh, acknowledging and appreciating our accomplishments. Are we spending enough time saying thank you to people? Thank you for coming. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you for being your authentic self. Are we spending enough time with that? Are we building our own resilience? Are we talking about resilience? What do you do to bring your resilience to work today? What is strong with you? Collaboration and mutuality. Uh, create what feels like a real invitation. Hey, we're going to have a staff meeting coming up on Tuesday. I'm really looking forward to seeing you. Has everyone had the opportunity to share? Not everybody wants to share. Not everybody wants to say, oh, I've got something to say. Um, and some people feel like, I don't know. Have you created, do you have a post-its on, the, and I did not do that, and I apologize for that. I usually do have a post-it there. So somebody can write something out if they have a question that can be answered later. And what is our process to share ideas and recommendations? Do we know how to share out? Okay, this is what we agreed to do. How are we going to share this with the rest of the staff? How are we going to share this with the volunteers? How are we going to share this with the board? Do we create a process that everyone can agree on how we're going to share out our ideas? Empowerment, voice, and choice. Um, are we spending enough time processing different points of view and different perspectives? Uh, people have different ideas. Are we giving voice to that? Encourage staff to sit next to someone who is calming. If we're gonna have a tough meeting or something's gonna happen, um, find somebody who you feel is a calm, stable person and sit right next to them. It's okay, it's okay. And uh, offer an honor choice. You know, how, how do people want material? Some people want an agenda. Some people don't need that. How do we do that? We email it, we give you paper, offer an honor choice. And of course, make it okay for people to process things differently. Uh, provide staff with resources on uh, cultural and historical and gender issues. Again, at Red Oak, we have a DE&I group. We do um, all kinds of things around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We hire intentionally people that don't uh, that people that do look like the children and the population that we serve, um, but recognizing those historical and cultural issues and create opportunities for staff to help bridge gaps. You have a heritage day. You know, what, what do you bring to the table that, that helps us understand you more in your cultural, cultural background? One person caring about another represents life's greatest value, and you guys certainly are champions of that. What questions, thoughts, comments, insights, feelings you have to share with the group? I wish I had this training like 40 years ago. <laughs> I think that's what keeps me coming 
back um, is that I discovered this probably about 10 years ago. It really changed the way I saw human behavior. Community mental health centers should be using some type of trauma screen. If you went to a private practice person, they, you could ask them if they screened for trauma, and they might use an ACE score, or they might use another instrument. But we need to help people identify what traumas are in their life so that we can talk about it and resolve it so it's just not so intrusive all the time. Can't take it away, but that's why it's so important that you know, people like Holly continue to be champions for mental health. Let's talk about it. Let's bring people into our, our family and talk about it. So maybe you can go out and say, hey, so-and-so, ask your doctor about trauma. You know, it's, it's okay. We don't, it's a stigma, I know. And it is so much easier, allegedly, to keep it inside. But it's so liberating to be able to talk about it safely. I am responsible for my self-injurious behaviors because of my trauma as an adult. But am I responsible for things that happened to me when I was little that are manifesting themselves in my life today? No, absolutely not. Love that. There's a book called What Happened to You. The book of uh, Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. And we have a group that I'm involved in. We have them read that. They also read The Body Keeps a Score, which is oh, yeah. a little more, yeah. a little heavier. Right. But what happened to you, I think, is a lovely view of that, what you talked about. Not what's wrong with you, but what happened, what happened. And how you can deal with it. How you and can deal I, with it. I had to read it, but I did it on audio. It's lovely, in my opinion. I don't know your thoughts, but it's just a unique viewpoint. Yeah, he's good. He's good. The Deepest Well is also a wonderful book about adverse childhood experiences by Nadine Burke Harris. She was the Surgeon General out in California. Wonderful writer. Um, so anything, if you feel comfortable with that, again, I don't want you to take a deep dive into any literature that you feel, how did I get here? <laughs> but yeah, it's Nadine Burke Harris. She wrote a wonderful book about the deepest well. It's about adverse childhood experiences. And of course, um, what happened to you by Dr. Perry and uh, Oprah Winfrey. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate all of you.